out sheet, just lift your hand right up and the ushers will see that you receive one and it's right in with the uh, prayer sheet. So if you need one of those as well, just lift your hand right up and go to Proverbs chapter 8 if you would please. Proverbs chapter 8 while you get settled in and turning to Proverbs 8, I just was thinking about the missionary letter that uh, Brother Friesen had uh, read for us. And uh, those uh, missionaries that serve in what is referred to nowadays as creative access countries, you do have to think outside the box, so to speak. In the past, you think of missionaries going on deputation, raising support, saying where they're going, and so on. But there are a lot of countries that are becoming even more and more closed to missionary endeavors. So they, uh, what's been common for a number of years was uh, people going into some of these countries uh, teaching English as a second language. And then a lot of the governments caught on to that. And so now many of the uh, missionaries are starting businesses in those countries. And so they're not there to make money as such, uh, but they go in there to set up a, a business, of course, that I trust would make money. But at the same time, that's where they like to begin and do their evangelistic and, you know, work as they develop relationships. And so uh, I know when it first started where missionaries would have to go in teaching uh, English as a second language, a lot of people got upset at that because they felt like somehow compromise was taking place. And then of course in the last, I guess, 10 years, 15 years now that uh, more and more going towards that business model that uh, folks are concerned about that as well. And uh, we need not be. Uh, there's, as we say, there's more than one way to uh, uh, skin a cat. <laughs> I don't know where that saying came from. Don't Google that on me, okay? <laughs> but that is a saying, right? Okay? And uh, so there is more than one way to get things done. And sometimes you have to think creatively. And uh, I appreciate the fact that there are folks out there just saying, look, if they say we can't do it one way, let's do it another way. And just try to find that way. If you're not compromising scripture, uh, find a way to get it done. Amen? Amen. So as we look at uh, Proverbs chapter 8, as you uh, see here, it's interesting to me when we look at this particular chapter, we see that wisdom is now brought to the forefront. And what I mean by that, you say, well, 31 chapters, it's all dealing with wisdom. But it's interesting that the aspect of wisdom is really highlighted for us, specifically in chapters 3 and 4. Then when we get to chapter 5, 6, and 7, we deal with the subject of immorality. We deal with the subject of laziness. And then we deal with the subject of adultery and again, immorality. And then we come here to chapter 8, and it's like, uh, Solomon begins to talk to his son again and talk about the blessings of wisdom. And so it's just interesting to me that he would almost take a parenthesis in time. He's uplifting wisdom and then he deals really specifically with some of the vices of the day as well as the troubles that uh, people have in the flesh, especially uh, young folks as a dad's talking to his son trying to alert him to some of the uh, vices of the day. And you notice too how we find the immorality that is so prevalent that he's addressing really uh, nestled in the middle of that was laziness. And so there's just something about if most people would look at their besetting sin that's talked about in Hebrews chapter 12, many times those besetting sins, not always, but many times they get their start or they have that continuance because of boredom. And maybe those times where things are, you know, there's not a whole lot going on as such. And uh, then, of course, you go into those, uh, those things. A lot of times, uh, if you're with the wrong crowd, they'll say, hey, what do you want to do? And hey, well, there's nothing to do. And then you end up doing something you should not be doing. So it's interesting how relevant, once again, the Bible is. I want to begin here by reading the first uh, 12 verses of scripture as you see here in Roman numeral number one. And as you're, you're there to Proverbs chapter eight, let me just say in the last few weeks, I have been going by my own notes and not really referring to the sheet that you have. And so the numbering hasn't always worked out. And so I was reminded of that. And so I'm going to try to stick with the same kind of handout sheet that you have. 
Okay? It says, Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? So, in other words, as we read this, it says cry. It doesn't say whimper. It doesn't say that he whispers. He cries. And one of the shames that we have in Christian circles is, is God speaks very clear to us. And he speaks loudly to us. And at the same time, we have the tendency to have, be dull of hearing, as Hebrews chapter 5 talks about. And here it says, wisdom cries. And it says, understanding puts forth her voice. And it says, she standeth in the top of high places, by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. In other words, if you and I want to hear wisdom, we can hear wisdom. If we want to keep from making mistakes, we can, we can keep from making mistakes. If we want to keep from sinning, we can keep from sinning. And so it's about time we face that. You know, a lot of times what we're doing is we're, we're playing catch up or we say, well, you know, uh, I fell down and, you know, now I need to uh, play a little smarter. Well, don't fall down to begin with because wisdom is crying out. And that's what Solomon is saying, look, now, son, you do something wrong and there's a way back to be sure. Praise the Lord. But it's best to hear the wisdom up front and not have to worry about the way back. Listen the first time. And it says here, unto you, O men, verse 4, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips." And all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. On your study sheet here it says, letter A, where is wisdom found? And if you're filling in the blanks, if you'll go to Psalm 91, Psalm 91, and that's what you should put in the blank there. In fact, the answer is, of course, uh, just another passage of Scripture in the Word of God. And so this is where wisdom is found. Remember when we started this series, I said, Someone I heard uh, preach say that you could take any time the word wise or wisdom is found, put Jesus in there. And uh, it says here in Psalm 91, and I'd like to read this passage for us tonight. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, that's a great verse of Scripture. How many times people have turned to Psalm 91 to get encouragement and help in a time of trouble and just to know that there is also a place that you can dwell, that you can stay under the shadow of the Almighty. And it says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. 
I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. You know, sometimes when we read passages of Scripture like that, and it's so upbeat, and it is, and it ought to be, it's the Word of God, at times when we are maybe experiencing something that's not upbeat, that seems to go diametrically opposed to what's here, we have the tendency to discount the veracity of that passage of Scripture. And yet nothing could be further from the truth because is you are abiding in Him, John chapter 15. Then understand that nothing is happening in your life by accident, that it is ordained by God. It's the will of God for your life to go through those circumstances, those situations, those troubles, those trials, those conflicts that you are going through because that is His will for you as you rely on His grace and His empowerment to go through those things, you become a shining testimony of God's grace to a lost and dying world. I've said many times that if everything's going well in your life, it's easy to praise God. It's easy to serve God. But how about when things are going awry? Uh, then as you are faithful to Him and then you, His faithfulness is being realized in your life and you're rejoicing in the trials and tribulations, that's when people look at you and say, wow, how do you do that? And thereby you have a platform for which to give forth the Word of God. And so we need to think things through and not just say, read a surface, uh, 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 a surface uh, you know, view of a particular passage of Scripture. We ought to think past that, what God's actually telling us. Because some of these uh, actual Bible writers went through some deep valleys, and yet they're writing passages of Scripture like this. And so we need to actually abide with Him. And then not only do we have the wisdom, the knowledge, the wisdom, but also the understanding that goes along with it. And so just a powerful passage of Scripture for us. So where is wisdom found? Wisdom is found with God. But it's found with God when you abide with Him. When you abide with Him. It's not just a cursory knowledge. It's not just saying, hey, look, I've got my way to heaven, and so now I'm on my own. No, never, never on your own. You ought to always be plugged in to our God. And then letter B, what does wisdom say? Verses 6, 7, and 8, it says this again, Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. Now remember, hearing in the Word of God is not just simple, the taking in of sound. Uh, when you have the words hear, it means to what? Hear with the intent to obey. And so Solomon's talking to his son and says, you know, I'm not just interested in staying up half the night to tell you some things and try to set you in, on, on a good course of life. You need to hear me. In other words, I'm telling you this, and if you do what I say, you're going to be the better for it. And so he says, hear for I will speak of excellent things. That word excellent here on number one, it means things that come from godly leadership. And that's what he's trying to say. Here's a king talking to his son. And so that, that word excellent things, that's the best uh, counsel, the best advice. People would go to the king not to just hear flippant advice. They wouldn't go to the king just to get an opinion. They'd say, look, King, what do you have to say about this? Because they looked at him as being wise. And we all have that opportunity to have God's wisdom upon us. Amen? But also God has given us counselors in our life to help us. And so, so many times we look for a stamp of approval rather than actually seeking the counsel out. And so here we find that uh, Solomon is telling his son, said, no, you need to hear for I will speak of excellent things. I'm going to tell you the best things. And so you remember in 1 Kings chapter 3 when uh, Solomon, he says, you know, Lord, I don't know how to go, go out and come in. He said, I'm so young. I don't know how to lead this great people, this great nation. So he asked God for wisdom. God gives him wisdom. And then right after that, he's put to the test. And he shows to the entire nation just the wisdom that God had given him in making that right decision with those two prostitutes with the one who had uh, lost the baby in death and the one that was alive and the, the trial that was before Solomon and yet God gave him the wisdom to make the right judgment. 
And that's the same God we serve today. And uh, we may not have that stark of an example that happens in our life, but yet we can have God's wisdom upon us. And it says here, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. Now when it talks about right things, it talks about things that are just. It's talking about things that are fair. Remember as we looked at chapter 1, it talked about equity and fairness and justice and so on. And so as we interact one with another, it's good to remember to be fair. I remember one of the slogans we had when we were in corrections, Brother Helm and I, when we worked at Indiana State Prison there, uh, it was be firm but fair. Firm but fair. And that will take you a long way if people know that even when you have to you know, maybe uh, come down on them, so to speak, or write a conduct report, or take them to lockup and whatnot, Hey, if you were abiding by the stated laws and boundaries that would be given, but yet you were firm but fair, that you weren't playing favorites, it was a whole lot easier to take. And here you find that Solomon is talking to his son and saying, Son, I'm going to teach you some things, and I'm going to teach you the right way, the right things. And then it says truth. And that's something that's missing today as well when you think about truth. Some people think truth is subjective, and uh, that's what we find prevalent in society today. You hear terminology like, uh, you know, what, that's good for you, but not necessarily good for me. That's true to you, but not true to me. And so truth is left up to individual interpretation. And yet we as believers know that there is what is referred to as objective truth. It's something that's concrete. It's something you can see and you can latch on to, it's sure. It's not left up to individual interpretation, it's stated. And that's why people don't like the Word of God and those who adhere to the Scriptures because it is objective truth. And that's why you can even go on the news broadcast and when they're pinning a preacher down or some other one who holds to the Gospel, what they'll do, they'll, they'll say, now are you telling me that Jesus is the only way? And boy, when you start actually getting into the scriptures and showing the objective truth, they react strongly to that. Who are you? And they actually blame you, but it's not you they're having a problem with. They're having a problem with the truth. Where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so his word, the Bible says, John 17, 17, is truth. And so it's so important for us to understand that as we take the truth to the lost and dying world, it will go fly right in the face of their, object, their subjective truth. Because they want to go by their feelings. They don't want to submit to the authority of the Word of God. And that's where the rub comes. So submission is a very important Bible doctrine as well, isn't it? So we see here by what, what does wisdom say? Excellent things, right things, as well as truth. Let her see. How does wisdom speak? How does wisdom speak? And it says here in your notes clearly, look at verse 9. They, they are all plain to him that understandeth, and write to them that find knowledge. It's interesting when you're talking to people, maybe on a group basis, and you have some that when they, you, you preach the word or you express something, a biblical principle, people say, yeah, I, I see it. Boy, it's so clear right there. And others say, well, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. But if you have understanding, you do see it. And you see, you remember knowledge and then wisdom is applied knowledge. And as you and I, the knowledge of the holy, what? It brings understanding. And so we need to understand that principle as it leads us along in life. Understanding will come as you begin to practice the knowledge that you've been given. It will come. All right. So, uh, what is the price of wisdom? Look at verses 11 and 12. The price of wisdom. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, Dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. And uh, let's uh, look at Proverbs 23, 23. It's a powerful little verse of Scripture. And it's one that uh, I, I don't remember who first uh, highlighted this verse to me. But it's where I really began to uh, see the value 
of building a, a good library. And uh, I know I'm old school. I, I, don't, I don't really go a lot with the, uh, the digital books and everything. I do have them, but I am a page turner. But it says here in Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom. In other words, it says buy wisdom, buy instruction, and buy understanding. And you know, we have a lot of people thinking that success is buying things. And here it says buy the truth. And uh, I always looked at it, if I, buy, if I buy a book and I get one good thought out of it, it's worth the price of a book. And so, you and I need to search out for the truth. And that's what Proverbs is all about. Remember in those opening chapters and even here in chapter 8, we are to search for uh, wisdom as we would for hid treasure. And so, if we knew that there was treasure hidden somewhere, many of us would be out trying to find that. You know, they have these games you play where you run around and you, you find this and you find that and people will almost break their necks trying to get to the next place so they can get to that treasure first. And, uh, you know, you and I need to understand that there's such value in chasing after the things of God. It's a rich treasure. And we'd be the better off if we put our efforts there. And what I wrote next to the very end of the first sentence I said, you know you have the fear of the Lord when you, and I put here, self-test. Uh, I'm not asking people to really look at this to give to someone else necessarily, but just to do a self-test. You know, do you have the fear of the Lord? You know, we throw these terms around, we see, we read them a lot, but do we ourselves have the fear of the Lord? And here's how you ask anything in my name. He says, I will do it. And so, why don't you pray and ask God to give you a holy hatred to that sin that you keep getting entangled with. And so, the Bible here says, if you have a proper fear, respect, awe, reverence for God, then you will hate evil. Then it goes on to say here in uh, verse 13, it says, is to hate evil, pride, it goes on now and actually gives us an explanation here of evil in more detail. Pride it talks about here. And I say this, this is really an inward, uh, uh, pride is in this context is inward. It's talking about where you actually feel, it's not necessarily seen on the outside. The next word deals with that, the arrogancy. But pride is a feeling of superiority. And so you can have someone who seems to slink around and act humble and all this kind of stuff outwardly, but inside it's really emanating from a spirit of pride where they feel superior even though they let on that they're humble. And so this is a self-test. No matter what your personality is, no matter what you are seeking to do on the outside, do you have a feeling that, hey, you're better than others? that you're really a better than the next person that you're judging and so on, that's pride and you ought to hate that. If we hate the things that God hates, then we're going to be okay. It flies in the face of the flesh, but yet at the same time, that's what we ought to strive for to keep under our body and bring it into subjection. Amen? And so then it says to hate evil. It means here to hate pride. And then it says here arrogance in verse, uh, verse 13, and arrogancy. And this arrogancy is really what we would say is an outward manifestation of the inward condition of pride. And that is when you find somebody who's haughty. They just, they're cocky. They're know-it-alls. They almost fit within the uh, definition of a fool, which will, as we go through the book of Proverbs, will give you the different characters that make up the, uh, the ones that, that Solomon is addressing so that you can identify a fool, whether you can know whether you've got some foolish traits or not, what the, actually identifies a simple individual, a wise individual, and so on. But here the arrogancy is that outward manifestation of the inward condition of pride. And you ought to hate that. Uh, you know, it ought to just rub you the wrong way if you have that tendency to be cocky. And to be, as you would say, maybe in sports, he's a showboat, you know. He's a, a ball hog, you know. You might say somebody who doesn't want to pass to the team, want, wants to do it all himself, rather than play as a team. 
and so on. You ought to hate arrogancy. And then letter D is you ought to hate the evil way. So it's interesting it says to hate evil. He goes in to explain uh, in, in more exact terms what evil is here as you see the colon. But at the same time to hate the evil way. And that's the pathway that leads to the act. So in other words, you, you need to uh, not only hate the act itself, but those things that lead you down that pathway, that lead you down that way. If you hate it, there's no way you're going to participate in it. And so it's just like if you hate a certain uh, food, you're going to avoid that food pretty much at all costs. And so you're not even going to want to go to that restaurant that's known for that food because you hate it. So you're not even going to go to the restaurant. You're not interested. And so it's the same thing when you and I are dealing with evil. We not only need to hate the act, but the roadway, the pathway that leads to that act. And then you see here letter E, you hate the froward mouth. Verse 13, it says again, and the froward mouth do I hate. Now, so you see where it says the froward mouth, I looked this up as a, as a dictionary definition, 1828 Webster's. It says here, not willing to yield or comply with what is required. You see, if you're not careful, the flesh has that rebellious tendency. If you're not careful, we have a rebellious heart. In other words, we don't like anybody telling us what to do, you know, because we want to do our own thing. We, you know, if we really want to do it, we're going to do it, regardless of what anybody says. Well, see, that's not willing to yield or comply with what is required, ungovernable, disobedient. That's the froward mouth. I would encourage you because that word for me anyway through the years has always been a little bit difficult for me to plant in my mind when I read that word froward. And so don't be afraid at times to create your own little Bible study book along with the Bible. And you may want to just put at the beginning of Proverbs what froward means. That way anytime you come across it you, you could you know, be reminded of that. Or in the back of your Bible you may take some of the blank pages and write your own little dictionary definition. That's really, if you think about it, uh, if you go to the bookstore and get a, a defined Bible, that's what they've done. They just pick keywords that they thought people would have a problem with understanding, and they've given a definition of it. And so there's nothing wrong with trying to look it up and find out what a word means, amen? And so uh, uh, if you don't li like writing in your Bible, then uh, why don't you take a separate notebook and do the same thing uh, that way. I think Brother David Cloud has a couple of books out, and he really did that by studying the Bible and then just writing some of the definitions and some of the studies that he made because he didn't understand a word or he wanted a fuller explanation of that particular word or passage. So you can create your own Bible study help uh, that way that's geared to you and your personality and your liking. And so, uh, hate the froward mouth. And that, that's a mouth too that uh, is uh, really always, when it talks about a perversity as such. Uh, you know, saying things with double meanings. And the double meaning is not uh, always wholesome. And so, you need to be very, very careful about the way you use your mouth. How do you use your mouth? So, this is a self-test. Uh, do you hate evil? Do you hate pride and arrogance and evil way and the froward mouth? Uh, are any of these characteristics part of your life? Then that's what you need to ask the Lord to deal with you on in regards to that so that you can have that proper fear of the Lord, that respect for Him. And so Roman number, number three says, wisdom is where God dwells. Wisdom is where God dwells. Of course, we made that point, letter A, Roman numeral number one, when we read Psalm 91. But let's read verses 14 and following here in uh, chapter 8 of Proverbs. It says, Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. By me kings reign and princes decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. You know, that word early actually means often. And so, if you keep searching and you seek 
Uh, often you'll find wisdom. What does the Lord say? You search for me with all your heart, I'll be found. You'll find me. But how many of us are willing to search? He says this in verse 18, riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches. That's riches that last and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. So where uh, wisdom is where God dwells, letter A, with counsel, his counsel. And you, you stop and think about Genesis to Revelation, and he's just, it's, this is a book filled with counsel. He says, look, you need to be saved, all ye ends of the earth. That's good counsel. <laughs> Amen. He tells us how to live life. That's good counsel. And that comes through prayer and Bible study. Because it's once you accept Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and then your mind can be illumined by the Holy Spirit. He's the illuminator, amen? And so counsel, prayer and Bible study. Uh, letter B, uh, love, we ought to love wisdom. We ought to have that love for wisdom. In verse 17 of our text passage of scripture, it says this, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Verse 21, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. And so then you seek wisdom, let her see. I wrote this in the notes. It was by wisdom the worlds were created. This same wisdom is available to us today. Letter D, wisdom must be your daily delight. That's one of the, the great habits to get into of having a, a daily devotional walk, is you're actually going to he who is the very personification of wisdom. And so he is wisdom. If you go to the seven spirits of the Lord in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 11, there's seven spirits there listed. There's the, the spirit of wisdom is mentioned there talking about God. And it lists the different aspects of the spirit, which is one of those is wisdom. And so wisdom must be your daily delight. Creation is the delight of God. Think about that when you, when you look at uh, Genesis chapter one and it says after the six days of creation, he, he looked at everything that he had made and behold it was very good. I mean, he doesn't make junk. He doesn't do something halfway. It's very good, it's the best, it's excellent. And see it says creation is the delight of God. So we are privileged to live in the midst of what delights God. Amen. And so then number four, wisdom cries out. If you'll look at our text here, wisdom cries out. We'll start with verse 32 down to verse 35. It says, now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Remember here with the intent to obey. Instruction, if you look at the word instruction and dissect it out, you'll notice that it's not just talking about a positive aspect of instruction, but also learning from the negative aspects of life. Amen? It says, hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. 
And then it says, blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors, for whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. You want God to be pleased with you? Seek wisdom. Seek Him. Early, often, daily. Seek Him. It says these uh, words, wisdom cries out, letter A, do what He says. That's the life of blessing. Do what He says. That's why you and I need to avoid that froward mouth that uh, prideful spirit, that arrogant strut that we might have thinking that we're better than others and we got everything under control. We don't have things under control. He does. Do what he says, the life of blessing. Let her be, be teachable. Someone said, make every man your teacher, even that one that does wrong. He can teach you what not to do. Okay, be teachable, good and bad. You can learn from everyone, amen. Be teachable. Are you teachable? Have you reached that place in your life where no one can tell you anything? You got all the answers? I trust not. Never come to the point in your life where you say, I got this. I've always said this uh, many times about the Apostle Paul. He said, you know, I've not arrived. He said, I've got a lot to learn. And I think we could all in our, in, in humility say, you know what, I think we all fit that bill. We all have a lot to learn. Amen. And I'm, I'm glad he's not finished with us yet. And letter C says, do not refuse godly counsel. Do not refuse godly counsel. We'll be talking about counsel, of course, as we go through this. But there's a portion of scripture that talks about you know, just not everybody's just going to walk around and tell you and give you wise counsel. It says you're going to have to what? You're going to have to actually draw it out of people. You see, I can remember a college professor of mine said, uh, "Unsought for advice is self, 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 seldom taken. Excuse me, seldom taken and often resented." And you know that's so true. You know, somebody they they may say, uh, "What do you think?" Well, if their mind's made up, they really don't want you to say what you think. And if you tell them what you think, then they're probably going to get mad at you. And so what you need to do is you need to sometimes just hold back. And sometimes those who have the best wisdom will hold back and just say, you know, I, I'm just not going to go there. And it's not that you're trying to make that person fall. It's just they're not going to listen to you anyway. And so you, will, you have that, that, that duplicity of feeling that you say, boy, I'd like to uh, help them and save them from trouble, but they won't listen to me anyway. And so you've got to be very, very careful. Do not refuse godly counsel. You ought to seek out that godly counsel. But if your mind's made up, don't ask. Letter D, look for wisdom daily. Look for wisdom daily. You know, I, th I think there's some things that would be wise to be on our prayer sheet, our personal prayer sheet all the time. And one of those is ask God daily for wisdom. Ask God to give you the right sources of knowledge. I told my pastoral counseling class, I said, you know, I've got thousands of book and books in my library. A lot of times when I'm trying to deal with a certain subject or trying to, you know, find out where I need to go for some additional information or something, I'll look at my library and I'll say, Lord, lead me to the right sources of knowledge. Because I've got a lot of books there. Where do you look? Where do you start? And so you need to ask for knowledge, the right sources of knowledge. This will work in what we would call the secular field too. Ask God to give you the right knowledge. And then ask God to give you wisdom. Ask Him to give you that wisdom. And ask Him to give you that understanding in that order. And something else, ask Him to give you love. Say, Lord, help me to love the way I'm supposed to love. You know, I'm not always lovely, and other people aren't either, but I need to love. Amen? Amen. And so just ask the Lord for love. And I think those are, are good qualities as we see here mirrored for us in the scripture that we ought to be asking for. And, and God is, I think He's pleased when we ask for things like that. So many times we come for, Lord, uh, give me a raise, Lord, give me a house, give me a car. Gimme, 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 you know? 
And uh, what we need to be doing is saying, Lord, I need you. I need you. And so always be alert to God's working and moving in your life. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever stopped? And maybe this would be a good time of year because many of you will have some extra time off. Just say, you know, I just want to reflect on, you know, how God's been working in my life this year. How he's been moving in my life. Sure, we've got a lot of frustrations that we could center our attention on, and I think probably we spend too much time centering our attention on those things. But you know, if we'd stop back and say, now, what has God been doing through this? What lessons has he taught me through this? How have I grown in him through this? You know, those lessons that you learn, things to do, things not to do, things you do differently, that's all wise lessons that we can, we can glean. But always be alert. God's doing this. And then number five, and lastly, we see here in verse 36. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Letter A, he sins who does not seek God's wisdom. He sins who does not seek God's wisdom. Letter B, he hurts his own soul. It's amazing how we hurt ourselves. We think maybe we're getting at somebody else when we're really just hurting ourselves. Then that deals with our mind, our will, and our emotions. And it says here, when you go against and not seeking God's wisdom, it says here, you sin, you, you wrong your own soul. You're just hurting yourself. And I wonder how many heartaches we could alleviate in our lives if we would just go God's way. If we wouldn't be froward if we wouldn't be pr uh, proudful, arrogant, you know, that we would hate the evil way instead of following our natural inclinations. And then let her see, and lastly, when you do not seek God's way, you are heading towards heartache and death. You're headed towards heartache and death when you don't seek God's way. Would to God we would be wise, amen? Not in our own conceits, wise in Him, amen? Amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. The Bible's rich, isn't it? Wow. And there's so many places, I, I think, as we read through these 36 verses, that you may have had some questions and say, boy, I wonder what that phrase means. I wonder what that word means. You know, it, we could be here for uh, many, many, many uh, days just dissecting this one chapter. And so... Uh, what a rich book the Bible is. But what has God expressed to you through what was given? The word that you did here tonight. How are you taking that truth in? How are you assimilating that?